All right, so the title of my talk is kind of a giveaway from the get-go. So this is not going to be kind of your case presentation from residency where they give you, you dole out some information and then the pimping session begins. Um, if anyone's got PTSD from, from residency on that, we've got Dr. Mulvaney in the house to set them up. Um, but really, my talk is, uh, is, my hope is to really just kind of reinforce a lot of what Dr. Fullerton just talked about in terms of uh, tensegrity, kind of uh, all the biomechanics that we learned in medical training don't necessarily apply. Um, thinking about prolotherapy more as a, uh, a whole approach and paradigm, uh, both uh, kind of multimodal in terms of diagnosis, uh, but also multimodal in terms of the treatment options. So what we see, structure and function with uh, spinal manipulation, joint mobilization, bolstering the protoplasm with nutrition and hormones, <clears throat> um, also getting into uh, neural fasciopathies, uh, expanding our differential diagnosis uh, with, with ultrasound evaluation, and not just thinking about the pain generators, but thinking more whole body uh, to, to help our patients and to restore the tensegrity mechanism. So the patient came to me um, for PRP sent by her orthopod for the sit bone pain that she had had for about a year. Um, she was, uh, she, she was a 40-year-old runner who complained of a gradual onset of pain, no trauma. Um, she described it with various descriptors as sharp, achy, dull, and it's moderate in, in, um, in severity. Symptoms were particularly exacerbated with running uphill and also was sitting for longer periods of time. She had alleviation with walking on, on level surfaces, uh, laying down, and then just changing her posture and her position from time to time throughout the day. Uh, associated symptoms included kind of a vague paresthesia going down the leg, but not all, all the way to the foot. And she otherwise denied any other neurological or constitutional symptoms. And again, no trauma from the past that could have spurred this on. Treatment-wise, she had had periodic temporary relief with uh, conservative treatments such as chiropractic, massage, physical therapy. Uh, and after the orthopedic surgeon ordered the, the MRI to evaluate the hamstring, which showed conjoint tendinopathy, there was a, a corticosteroid injection performed, which gave her some partial temporary relief as well. Um, <clears throat> other radiological tests, including the x-rays, were, were, were basically negative. Past medical history and review of systems, really only remarkable for uh, a C-section. And then she had probably related to that some stress incontinence. And she also reported frequent, frequent ankle sprains that hadn't really been recurrent um, recently. Physical examination. She had a Trendelenburg on the right. Um, and the standing forward and sitting forward bending tests, uh, in osteopathic structural evaluation, we use those tests in tandem to look at iliosacral, sacral ileal dysfunction. And essentially, it's looking at the relationship between the PSIS and the sacrum. And so what we're looking for is a restricted pattern there. So when we test the patient, the dysfunctional side will glide cephalad. And when we use the tests in tandem, the one that is more remarkable is where we focus our treatments for manual therapies. Gillette's test, kind of similar to the standing forward bending test, looking at that iliosacral dysfunction, uh, was positive with her. She also had a restricted right hip external rotators and a right anterior rotated innominant. Positional diagnosis, and again, back to the kind of some of the osteopathic nomenclature. For the axial spine, we, we look at the uh, anterior vertebral body as the reference point, so everything is, is according to that. Uh, in this patient, she had a deep sacral sulcus on the right. Uh, L5-S1 was FRS to the right, so it was rotated to the right. And there was a left-on-left -left sacral torsion with the inferior lateral angle of the sacrum, posterior and inferior. And interestingly, if, if any of you have read the book uh, Movement Stability and Low Back Pain, Frank Willard does a nice um, dissection of the dorsal sacral ligaments. And it falls along the lines of of the, the, the pattern of the fibers run along these virtual axes that Fred Mitchell talks about when he talks with his muscle energy model of the pelvis. 
palpation. And again, Dr. Fullerton mentioned it. It's a, kind of a hallmark of the prolotherapy paradigm. Um, commonly, you'll get patients with subjective pain, uh, like this patient with pain right on the sit bone. But of course, once you start palpating, they're going to say, oh, yeah, uh, didn't realize I hurt here. Um, and sure enough, um, thinking of these regional approaches and whole body approaches and how we treat the tensegrity mechanism, um, these become our treatment targets as well. Um, <clears throat> this patient had tenderness, bilateral glutes, dorsal sacral ligaments, obturator internus, and of course at the, at the conjoined tendon. Uh, on her motor strength exam, she had, uh, it was basically normal except she had bilaterally inhibited multifidi <clears throat> and gluteus maximus on the affected side. Special tests, so, so uh, localizing provocative tests for the SI joint. Faber's test was positive on the right. Gensland's also testing this area uh, to rule out any internal derangement in the hip. These special tests with the Fadir, fulcrums, and scour were negative. Um, also, for uh, dermatomal or nerve root impingement, uh, straight leg raising was negative. <coughs> so differential diagnosis. So 10 years ago, I wouldn't have had to have, uh, would, wouldn't have had as broad of a differential diagnosis for butt pain, um, especially without ultrasound um, and coming to these meetings. Because in my training in internal medicine, they, any patient who presented with, with butt pain and leg symptoms, it was, they were just marched on the track of lumbar radiculopathy and they were gone. Maybe they would talk about refer pain from a Travell's trigger point or myotomal refer pain, but there wasn't as broad or an extensive kind of differential diagnosis uh, in, that, in that training period for me. Um, we know from the literature that lumbar radiculopathy, so back pain with leg symptoms, really accounts for about 30 to 40% of the patients. The rest of the time, it's some, some kind of uh, overlapping pain pattern, the SI joint, facet, all these other uh, structures. So that's really the quest in trying to figure out these problems is, you know, is it coming from the SI joint, piriformis syndrome? I get a lot of PTs who'll send patients to me uh, saying, I think they have piriformis syndrome. And I'll call them back and I'll say, well, I got ultrasound, I can cheat. I know exactly where it is. Um, but the truth is, most of the time they're gonna have kind of more of a, like a guitar string hypertonicity at the glute mead, and it's not gonna be anywhere near kind of uh, the piriformis, and, and we know from the literature that it's pretty rare. Uh, infection in neoplasm, um, pretty uncommon, although every couple years I'll catch a, a masquerader of some underlying metastatic cancer. Um, also, we know from the literature that uh, gluteal pain, butt pain can be an atypical presentation about 30% of the time of <coughs> internal derangement of the hip. Um, <clears throat> In runners, I've definitely seen ischial uh, stress fractures, uh, which is a consideration. Uh, ischial bursitis, I think uh, the era of bursitis is kind of going away as we get more specific about things and has acted as more of a wastebasket terminology of a syndrome, perhaps. And of course, with pelvic enthesopathy uh, from the prolotherapy paradigm, weakness at the weld, et cetera, uh, along with the hamstring tendinopathy. And then Recently, with uh, liftoff's work and with ultrasound, being able to add cutaneous nerves into our differential diagnosis. Uh, another entity that I haven't seen a lot of, but have read about a little bit, is uh, ischial femoral impingement. I'm not sure that we know exactly the underlying issues there. Um, and of course, uh, osteopathic diagnoses with segmental dysfunction. So here's a, here's a game changer for me when I started to learn it was the posterior cutaneous nerve of, of the thigh. And you can see it, uh, Dr. Steele talked about it uh, with the, the fascial planes and just following these nerves and how small they get and uh, the time it takes to just kind of go through it and, and try to find them. And um, this one lives up in here in this fascial plane above the conjoined tendon uh, below the glute max and can be a definite cause and, and a great little tool in your toolbox uh, to, to rule it out as one of the, uh, the problems in these patients with recalcitrant gluteal pain. Here's a, here's a long axis image, and you can see the conjoined tendon, and then this fascial plane where the posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh travels. Who knew about the colonial nerve? I never heard about it in training. Um, 
I was probably seven years in practice when I first learned about the coronial nerve. And then I read that uh, the orthopedic surgeon uh, Robert Manya or Maine uh, reports it as a, as a huge uh, kind of culprit in low back pain disability. So it's another great little tool to have to be able to evaluate uh, for the colonial nerve entrapment. Ischial femoral impingement, I don't see a lot of this, um, but I've read about it, like I said, and this is basically uh, an impingement of, uh, of the quadratus femoris. You can see with, with external rotation, it closes off that space and impinges on the quadratus femoris, maybe even the sciatic nerve. Uh, a lot of people are injecting this with corticosteroid. I really wonder kind of what some of the underlying issues are there. Could there be some hip instability going on that leads to this? Um, could be. So with my patient, I diagnosed her with, with hamstring tendinopathy and also associated SI and pelvic enthesopathy. Okay, so what I'll commonly do with patients, um, especially after they've gone to, to multiple doctors and they haven't had their, their uh, pain solved, um, <clears throat> they can become skeptical. So sometimes to get more buy-in or to convince myself of the diagnosis, I'll offer them diagnostic injections with, with lidocaine to identify the pain generators. And I know Dr. Uh, Fullerton talked about kind of getting out of that paradigm. This is kind of more of an old school prolotherapy paradigm, but it's, it is an effective thing, I think, in terms of getting some buy-in and finding some of the pain generators, but then also having the ability to kind of go broadly and think big picture about the patient. Uh, this patient had had um, <clears throat> C-section and, and had likely stress incontinence from that. So as part of her overall protocol, I had her do some not only core work, but also uh, doing some pelvic floor exercises, which is a, a critical piece here. Um, she was age 40, and um, I think you've probably all encountered, if you're doing any functional medicine, when you start having that hormone conversation, uh, a lot of fear stuff can come up. So I generally try to start off that conversation and um, see if they're open to it and see if, if, if that's a reason that we can uh, get them better and help them. Same thing with nutrition. So what did I treat in her? I treat, treated the reason that she came in, the conjoint tendon. Also, uh, sacral tuberous ligament coming up, the glute med, the glute max, up onto the thoracolumbar insertion here at the iliac crest. All along, up into the lateral angle of the sacrum, dorsal sacral ligaments, iliolumbar ligament. You can see here on the anterior surface of the ilium with the iliolumbar uh, ligament insertions from L4 and L5 coming down. And I always like to put this picture up in my office or show them on the model is, is, is really kind of uh, just reminding myself that a ring of stability when it's compromised with any SI dysfunction to always look to the front of the pelvis as well. And this is kind of the intro. If you, a female patient is new to you and you're going to start palpating there and, and they have a rationale for understanding why, um, you know, this is part of the physical examination. So Dr. Scheipel talked about the rehab protocols. Um, I got this protocol from uh, Scott Primack, who's a DO here in town. And um, this is part of, I think, some of the stuff from uh, Ken Montner and uh, Gerald Malanga. Um, and it and it's just pretty much mimics what, what Brian talked about uh, yesterday with these three phases of healing. And I'm not going to go totally into the weeds on it, but I think that in the past, I've, I've probably been too aggressive with progressing to strengthening with some of these patients. And in the early phases, and this is really more for a spine case and for PRP, you probably do different time frames for prolo. Um, but the first one to three weeks is really just gentle active, ra active range of motion, no terminal end range motion, no NSAIDs, um, and just looking at the mechanics and avoiding uh, uh, lifting. Second phase, Four to six weeks, early tissue healing, collagen deposition, starting to do some more active range of motion with isometrics, um, and then just uh, keeping a neutral spine and working on its core stability and activation. And then in the final stages, <clears throat> seven to 12 weeks, uh, progressive resistance strengthening and then adding weight as tolerated, and then a progression to sports-specific exercise. 
So my patient did great after three treatments, and then she had the pain starting to come back. So, so why, why did the pain come back? Was it that I didn't have exosomes in the syringe? Was it that I didn't have stem cells or A2M? What was the deal? And so uh, one of my mentors used to say um, this, this quote from his mentor, Fred Mitchell Sr., who came up with, with muscle energy. And their whole thing was to find the area of greatest restriction as it related to the hypermobility. I think that the model is a little bit incomplete because I still think that with a lot of patients, you're still going to have to treat the hypermobile segments and so forth. But his focus was this area of greatest restriction thing. Um, and uh, with that in mind, uh, when the patient came back, she had not a severe pain, and it was much more localized, um, but she still had the persistent gluteal pseudoparesis on that side. And thinking back to some of the lectures here about tensegrity, uh, knowing what we know from the rehab literature about disruption of the, of the posterior kinetic chain with any lower extremity injury, uh, which would be a likely culprit into this patient's uh, situation, um, I started thinking a little bit differently about what to do with her. And, and of course, as we're trained, anytime a patient does, doesn't get better, we're always going back to get more history, or in this case, reminding myself of the history relating to her ankle sprints. And so um, what I did differently in this case was I did diagnostic injection of the ATFL, and then she had restored gluteus, uh, a gluteus maximus function. And so really what I kind of determined as, as her final diagnosis was, was really this ankle instability, which led to the muscle imbalances and overuse of the hamstring tendon and the SI ligaments as well. And so it really kind of feeds what, what uh, Dr. Fulton was talking about in terms of not getting too trapped in, in these regional approaches or the pain generators or chasing the pain. Uh, Dr. Stiles would always say, anytime you're chasing the pain, you're, you're two steps behind them. So um, keeping the mind open and uh, thinking about these other possibilities. Also, it, this case reminded me of uh, one of the quotes from Hackett's book, um, that you're only as healthy as your weakest ligament. And again, it reminded me of kind of the whole fascial conversation and education that we're getting um, and the functional anatomy. Because what we see is that down at the midfoot, there's fascia with, with the peroneus longus attaching up to the biceps femoris, going up to the sacral tuberous ligament, dorsal sacral ligaments, and the thoracolumbar fascia. And this continuity of, of continuous tension. So uh, this is what the... the the case did for me uh, because I got too locked into the, the regional approach. And coming to these meetings has afforded me the ability to kind of think differently about these cases to, to help my patients. So this patient basically had to treat the ankle and then also the conjoint tendon and obturator and continued on with her, her rehab protocol that she was doing before and she did really well. So that's really it. Thank you.